Lewis. I'm the research director here at Chatham House for International Security. And it's my great pleasure to have um, such a fantastic panel with us here tonight, who are all members of the Global Commission on um, Drug Policy. And we're here uh, launching the report, The World Drug Perception Problem, Countering Prejudices about people who use drugs that has just been released. Um, we're very lucky to have with us here tonight um, people who have real experience in changing the way people think about very big issues. Um, before we start, what I'd like to ask you to do is make sure that you have your phones switched to silent. Um, if you could also remember to tweet a lot, if you are a tweeter, that would be great. Um, and if you could also um, uh, participate in the Q&A as soon as we've heard from each of the panelists and participate as much as you possibly can. I want to see lots and lots of hands up, lots of interaction, lots of discussion over what is such an important issue. Um, <clears throat> we have with us uh, here tonight Helen Clark, who's the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and the former Administrator for the United Nations Development Programme, UNDP. We have Nick Clegg, who's the Deputy Prime Minister of the UK, former Deputy Prime Minister of the UK. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remind me. <laughs> um, and uh, former leader of the Liberal Democrats. Uh, Ruth Dreyfus, who is the former president of Switzerland and the chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. We have Asma Jahingir, who is the, uh, was the UN Special Report Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion. We have Michelle Kazakin, <coughs> um, who was the executive director of the Global Fight Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. And we have Olu Segun Obasanjo, who was the former president of Nigeria. So as you can see, this is a very heavyweight lineup today. And what they want to talk to you about is how we perceive people who use drugs. And that's an awful lot of us. It's, I remember, Ruth, when you were here before, one of the things you said is that when we look at the number of people who use drugs and we look at our policies on drugs, what we're often doing is punishing people for being human. And that stuck with me. I remember thinking about it. And I, I remember thinking a lot about the way in which we view people who take drugs and what sort of drugs we allow people to take and what sort of drugs we don't allow people to take. And I think what this report does is it opens up that debate. And it makes us think differently about how we are perceiving people who take drugs. So... To get this conversation going, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to each of the panellists in turn, and each of them is going to speak for only five minutes maximum. Less if you can do it. That would be great. And then I'm going to open up the floor to discussion. We are being live-streamed, so I'm welcoming all the people who are listening online right now. Um, and I'm going to start with you first, Ruth, as the chair. So if you could... Tell us, please, the reason behind the establishment of the Global Commission and what has been its role in global drug control discussions and how did it get to address drug policy as a social topic rather than as a criminal justice or just a medical issue? How, how has it been framed within the Commission? Thank you so much and uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be again here in Chatham House. And, uh, you know, this house is also a house where in all discussion all over the world, there is always a moment when we, we speak about the Chatham rules. And uh, so that here we are in the center of a free discussion where everybody can really speak out uh, without uh, being afraid of being quoted and without being restrained by their position or their political uh, mission or at, uh, yeah, commitments. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. The Global Commission on, on Drug Policy is a self-committed uh, commission. We received the mandate from ourselves, and it was a deep, a deep need for all of us to continue based on our experience, based on 
the leadership we had or still perhaps have uh, to uh, become an actor in the reform of drug policy. So we are coopted or coopting each other. Uh, we are now 25 members. We want to enlarge it to more uh, members also from Africa and Asia, even if we are very happy about those members who are coming from this uh, region. But we, we still uh, feel that the origin of the Global Commission was on one side Latin America with the problem of corruption, of the threat the war on drugs had on the functioning of normal democracy through corruption, through violence, and so on. And on the other side, the experience of European countries taking it from another point of view, the point of view of the epidemics of AIDS and the uh, way drug policy was uh, wrong. Drug policy was also fueling the epidemic. So the encounter between these two kind of experience is at the origin of this group uh, called the Global Commission on Drug Policy. We are citizens of the world, committed to change the world because this or to be a part of the change of the world. We are also a learning group, and this is something uh, that makes me very happy also to be a member uh, since the beginning of the Global Commission. We are learning, I would say, every day ourselves to understand better <coughs> what are uh, the problem linked with drugs uh, and uh, criminal organization in, in the world. And uh, we are progressing also, I would say, from one report to the other. Reports is one of the way we try to advocate for change uh, from the beginning, from breaking the taboo to uh, this uh, report we are publishing uh, today. Uh, we began probably with an analysis about how to better prag pragmatically drug policy through health policy, uh, public health, harm reduction, a larger scale of uh, treatment, uh, dealing also with access to controlled medicine like morphine for people in pain, which are uh, often having no access to what they need because of the strong uh, prohibition of the substance and the negation and of the double purpose of, uh, of opiates. Uh, and we continue really in this learning process, I would say, to see the criminalization as one of the main difficulty to change policy, to change the way people can have access to what they need, uh, the services they need, the, <coughs> the social integration they need, and so on. And from this point, uh, we went to the need not only to decriminalize uh, lies the consumption on a very solid philosophic basis in the sense of how could the state punish people because they are people, because they are human, and not harming uh, others and uh, building obstacles to what their uh, real needs are. But uh, we went to the uh, need to be really coherent to take off the market of illicit substance from criminal hands, which is to end prohibition, to regulate the markets of all drugs, to take control by the state. At this point, we saw that uh, one of the obstacles to change policy is the perception of the problem. So that we thought that it is our duty also as opinion leaders uh, to address the problem of the perception of the substance themselves and uh, the people who are uh, using them. And this is the reason why we published now uh, this uh, report. Our influence, just to finish, is uh, difficult to measure. I let it more to my colleagues uh, because I have always a little bit doubts and know that uh, we need a lot of time to change the, the things. Uh, but our means to act are these reports, 
uh, conversation at the highest level in different countries, uh, bridging also between the NGOs and the authorities because we have access to both sides, I would say, of this uh, very important uh, conversation to give the possibility of people who, con who use drugs also to become uh, vocal and we, we give them also uh, the platform to uh, express their, their needs and, and who they are. So this is uh, what we are doing, uh, I would say, every day as a personal and collective commitment. Thank, Thank you. you. So and I think one of the things that really stood out for me in reading the report was the stories that are in here. And there are some really moving, and very thought-provoking stories in, in the report. Don't, Helen. Don't speak about the people. Let them speak. Let them speak. Is, is yes, very important. Exactly. Yeah. And their experience. So, Helen, you're, you're fairly new to the commission. Um, and so you have a very different view, perhaps, and having seen it from afar when you were working in the UN. Um, and um, what are some of the things that... The, being on the commission has changed in terms of your perceptions of the of the problem. How do you now view it, having come onto the commission, and perhaps what have you learned um, as a result that you think could help other people think perhaps differently about this topic? Well, firstly, I think what's very important about the commission is that it is a commission of senior and serious people who will be listened to, and. <coughs> in my previous capacity at UNDP, and UNDP under my leadership was prepared to take a stand on, on these issues, it mattered a great deal to have the commission and its voice being heard. Uh, so the issue couldn't just be relegated out to a fringe. There were senior and serious people who were taking it up. Now my own engagement with it really goes back to being a, a young health minister about uh, close to 30 years ago. And the entry point was the response to HIV. Because with HIV in, in Western countries generally, you had three key populations uh, that were particularly at risk. Uh, one was gay men, uh, a second was sex workers, and the third were people uh, using drugs, uh, particularly those who, who, who injected drugs. So if you didn't deal with uh, the needs and concerns of those populations in a very practical way, if you didn't put any you know, particular views you had or anyone had about these particular behaviours aside, you could not have a pragmatic response to the epidemic. And I think generally in Western countries, the response was pragmatic. So in my country, going back to the mid-80s, not long before I became minister, needle exchanges were introduced and so on. I find it interesting, though, as I reflect that in the response to HIV, uh, uh, New Zealand Parliament did move to decriminalise uh, male gay sex, right? That was 84. Uh, when I was Prime Minister, we decriminalised sex work. We have not yet decriminalised drugs. It, it, it's somehow the hardest of, of, of all the issues. Why do you think that is? So, so why is this? I think it comes back uh, to the problem of the UN conventions. The problem of uh, these certain categories of drugs uh, being seen as criminal activity if, if you use them. And so it follows from that that there's a narrative that says bad people do these things uh, because it is criminal. That's why decriminalisation is really so, so critical to, to getting more and, and better and evidence-based approaches. Uh, so this report deals with, with perceptions. The perceptions are grounded, I think, in the criminalisation. If you are a person using drugs, you're a bad person because you're, use, you're uh, breaking the law and therefore there will be punishment associated with that. When actually the, the, the use of drugs requires uh, a health and safety approach, a social policy approach, a safe spaces approach. Uh, so you know, generally the settings are all wrong. And uh, I think you know, many of our countries can learn a lot from those like Portugal who stepped up and said, we've got a problem. We have a lot of people uh, dying from the use of drugs. They shouldn't be dying. There is quite a spike in drug deaths in this country, uh, which could be dealt with by different uh, public policy uh, approaches. Uh, but really dealing with the perceptions of the people who use drugs is critical to getting through this, this barrier uh, to better public policy. Thank you. Nick. So 
we're seeing quite a different range of public views in Europe, in the United States, in other parts of the world. Um, and we're seeing big changes in those public perceptions. Um, what about here? Are we seeing a change in public perceptions here about uh, drug policy? And is there even a really um, open debate taking place in our political structures about this issue? So the curious thing here is that, um, at least right now, there's absolutely no interest in... I mean, Theresa May is famously uninterested in, 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 in reopening this issue, uh, even as Helen just mentioned, there's been a shocking spike of uh, drug-related deaths uh, to unprecedented levels in the United Kingdom recently. So the central government, uh, number 10, are completely uninterested. Uh, we have these very powerful, uh, rather vituperative, vested interests in the national press who, who, who act as sort of guard dogs that snarl at any whiff of reform. So in the sort of centre, nothing's happening. Now, it might happen, and we have some distinguished parliamentarians here we will look to in the years to come to promote a more sensible reform. But the interesting thing is that notwithstanding that sort of stasis at the centre, at the top of government, there's a sort of pincer movement of reform from below, well, not quite above, but and around. I mean, if you look on the ground, some remarkable things are happening. If you look at what's happening in Durham, the chief constable and the uh, police and crime commissioner in Durham has basically introduced decriminalisation. They've introduced a uh, programme, uh, what's it called? Uh, I forgot, I forgot its name now, Checkpoint, that's right, Checkpoint. which is basically a diversion scheme. So people who are caught with uh, drugs uh, for their own personal use are given a choice. You either go down the criminal justice route or you go down a diversion route. That's now being emulated in Bristol. Uh, other police and crime commissioners are looking very closely at what's happening in Durham. Actually, the Durham police uh, force is one of the best performing in the country, so they can't be criticised for somehow being soft on crime. They're actually extending it to individuals who are, se sell very hard drugs, heroin, uh, one to the other, those who already uh, are, are using uh, heroin. So some quite radical things are happening. There are, um, there are initiatives underway. Well, the, the one in Glasgow has got slightly blocked for legal reasons, but in Wales as well. So you've got, you've got a sort of grassroots innovation happening, regardless of the indifference at the centre. And then, of course, around us internationally, the scene is changing utterly. Not only the uh, reforms that we're familiar with in Switzerland, the Czech Republic and Portugal, but we now have reforms underway um, on production, drug production in the Netherlands. Uh, Germany is moving apace in terms on, on, on the medical use of cannabis and uh, cannabinoids. Uh, there's a review on decriminalisation in Ireland, as Helen was explaining to all of us earlier. There's a referendum uh, in, in New Zealand uh, in, uh, in, the, in the next period of time uh, on uh, the regulated sale of, of, of cannabis. Of course, North America, you can now travel from the Arctic Circle down to the, to the Mexican border um, uh, and be in jurisdictions all the way along the West Coast um, uh, in areas uninterrupted which now have regulated, controlled markets for the sale of, uh, of cannabis. Uh, the sale, the, the market which is now, the regulated market which has now come live since last week in California is the largest of its kind anywhere on the, on the planet. It's the sixth largest economy. Um, and of course Canada is is, is framing, in my view, from what I can make out from a distance very intelligently, um, a, a new regulated market as well. So, and the interesting thing throughout all of the, in the international experience is that the advocacy of regu regulated controlled sale of drugs, of cannabis, which used to have a sort of whiff of laissez-faire libertarian ideology around it, has now quite rightly evolved into it in a more mature way <coughs> as an evidence-based way of actually asserting control where there is no control and reducing harm where harm is otherwise escalating. I think that's a, that's a really powerful development. Now, surely it just defies logic that we can have these innovations taking place under our nose here in the United Kingdom, have all of these reforms taking place across the developed world, from New Zealand to, to, to California, across the mainland of Europe, and we somehow remain utterly immune to these reforms in our national debate. I just don't believe that's going to happen. Now, there's rumblings in the, in the Westminster undergrowth that the two larger parties, or parts of the two larger parties, might wish to, it's very British this, reach for a royal commission um, as a way forward, which is generally the way that 
run inches towards reform in a slightly peculiar way. If you call it royal, then it all seems okay to everybody. <laughs> we agree. Um, we agree. Well, it's the Royal Institute of International <laughs> Affairs, so uh, <laughs> I, I feel we're in good, we're in good company to talk about a royal commission. Uh, so I, I believe that notwithstanding the resistance to change at the, at the heart of government uh, and large parts of the national press, I think the pressure from below and above and around will lead to reform in this country as well. Thank you. Um, Olu, how do you see what's going on in the continent of Africa? Do you see big differences in policies between different African countries? Do you see um, the type of policies that we've seen in some, for example, European countries, uh, Asian countries on um, much more sort of hard line approaches? Or do you see a, an adoption perhaps and a discussion about um, more uh, public good type of approaches to drug policies in African countries? And what are the differences um, in between African countries and the debate that's going on? Well, th thank you very much. <clears throat> I got deeply involved and um, later on I became a member of the Global Commission after I have been the chair of uh, West Africa Commission on Drug. And what uh, we got from that was s stunning to all the members of that commission because the thinking in our part of the world had always been that we are not uh, producers, we are not consumers, we, we are just uh, transit. Um, leave the producers and consumers alone to do their thing. And the first thing we found was that um, we are becoming more and more consumers than uh, even some of the countries that we tag as consumers. That's the first uh, uh, revelation from that uh, commission. The second, which really uh, brings one to the report that we are launching today, is the understanding, or should I say lack of understanding, of the issue by leaders, political leaders, um, leaders in almost all walks of life, traditional leaders, uh, and the media. Um, the feeling and belief is that if you are somebody using drug is because you are a reject of the society, you are a never do well, you, are, uh, you haven't been uh, well brought up, and um, the society and nobody should really worry about you. Um, and so why should you worry about that uh, sort of person? Uh, the belief, similar to some people, who believe that if you are poor, it is your problem. You are poor because you are lazy. You are poor because you haven't taken advantage of opportunities that uh, were there. Not really thinking of the distribution, the governance, and all that that created the situation of poverty. Where now, the, as a result of this perception both by leaders and the media, um, the attention uh, that you be given was not really, really given. And we term that, uh, the, we call our report, not just in transit. It's just uh, to make sure, to make people know that we are really in a serious problem. Now, the situation in African countries differ from country to country and from the uh, composition of the country. Uh, some uh, largely Islamic countries will say to us, please don't talk of decriminalization because if you say that, 
um, our clergy, our religious leaders will see that as you uh, advocating that everybody should be uh, a, a user of uh, drug, uh, should be people uh, using drug. Now, there are other countries that are taking the issue seriously. At least they are getting involved in harm, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, harm reduction uh, um, uh, actions uh, and, and programs. Like in a country like uh, uh, Senegal, where they now uh, publicly allow people they provide needle so that um, the, 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 the people who use drug can uh, be saved and they provide uh, some form of uh, 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 injection safe injection rooms um, uh, and that is taking place not only in uh, Senegal but in countries like uh, Kenya, in Tanzania, but more in the uh, eastern part of Africa than in the west. Then there are countries like Ghana, who are in fact now at the point of considering decriminalization uh, law, and um, uh, uh, that is coming up. So if, if I can sum up um, the question you asked, uh, Patricia, it, it is this, that I believe the awareness, the understanding, and the knowledge that we are, are, are advocating that should be uh, there by leaders at the political level, by leaders at the traditional level, by uh, community leaders, will make people to realize that uh, petty users or petty people who use drug should not be regarded as criminals. Their cases should be treated as health cases rather than criminal justice cases. And in such a way that when we, did, we carried out our um, uh, um, a job of our commission, we found that in no country is the issue of drug under the Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. They are all under the Minister uh, of Justice or the Attorney General, which strict away means that, yeah, it, it, uh, you take him, you put him mm -hmm. in jail. The third point that I want to make is that the big drug, drug uh, bureaus get away. It is the small, uh, small fries that are picked and put in jail. And Pat uh, Patricia, I was in jail. So I met these boys in jail. I wasn't in jail for drug offense, <laughs> not, even, not even for criminal offense. I was in jail because I opened my mouth too wide and I said a military leader should get out of the uh, politics and uh, go home. And rather than go home, he put me in jail. <laughs> now, I met these boys in jail, and their position is pathetic. You find a boy who, what all young people do, experimental, uh, experimenting, experimenting with uh, smoking uh, whatever it is they can get, or even going to some form of adventure. And then you, put, you pick them, you put them in jail. They come out more hardened and when they go in. Mm -hmm. And yet, we think that it is working. It is not working. This perception has to be changed. And when the perception changes at the leadership level, it will permeate to the entire society. And we will move forward. Thank you very much. Asma, you've also been in jail. You've also been in prison for your, what you've said and, and your commitment to human rights. Um, and if you look at the issues of human rights and the issues of drug use and drug policies, um, we've seen a number of violations of human rights reported um, by, um, for example, the High Commissioner for Human Rights. 
And so how would you say that this relates to the perceptions that we see about drug use <coughs> and uh, what we consider to be uh, legal, illegal, criminal or not criminal, and the way in which then human rights become central to that debate? Mm. I think human rights is central, but I would like to start with my experience, not in jail, but in Honduras, where I went as special rapporteur or UN on extrajudicial killings. And there were street children who were taking drugs. And a number of them were killed by the police as indispensable. And it really broke my heart. I went to see them in prison and I was thinking all day today about it, and it was in my report as well, how those children felt outcasted, how they were remembering the love of their mother because they felt even the parents would not accept them. And it is this stigmatization because of the criminalization of it. And wherever you have prohibition, whether it is on drugs, or whether in many Muslim countries on drinks. This is how it happens where the more marginalized and the more vulnerable are exploited, are stigmatized, while you know there is a class of people that enjoys it and has access to health services. By criminalizing it, you are refusing a person to even have access. Uh, to health services, so it's a denial of human rights, in my view. If you also look at the fact that there has been no drug policy which has looked at it from the rights perspective, human rights perspective, either internationally, regionally, or domestically. I mean, it's, it's a crime, put people in. Without looking at many facets of crime. As a lawyer, I believe that anything that's a crime, which is a victimless crime, where you cannot have a direct victim to it, uh, is really something uh, that will always be exploited. I mean, if you're drunk and driving, of course you'll be penalized. If you're, if you're drugged and you murder, of course you'll be penalized for murder, but not per se. For, the, for a person to use drugs, not per se for a person to take alcohol. So this is, I think, this, this mindset needs to be changed. I also find that uh, when you have a total ban and you criminalize it, you deny the possibility of a state or a government to regulate it, which is extremely essential. Regulate, open up, services, not only health, but others as well, to people who, are, who feel that they want to use it in a particular way or not use it or to get out of it, they need help, assistance. That assistance is completely denied to them. And I, I really do feel, especially when I think about not only the children in Honduras, but also people that I met in jail, the criminalization is indignant, it indignifies persons who use drugs. And I don't think that that is, um, that is uh, fair, that that is uh, human towards people who are not harming anyone else but themselves, in a, if at all, in some cases. My last point is that by placing a ban and prohibiting um, something of a nature which, as I said earlier, is a victimless crime, raises prices, makes cartels, pushes it underground, and that is where crime, in fact, generates itself. And as our friend, Mr. Basanju, said this morning, that now there is a connection that you can make not of people who use drugs, but of people who have exploited the prohibition with politics. And I can make a connection between underground economy and that. And not only underground economy, I think sustainability of deep states within the state. 
because of the prohibition of drugs and the economy that, that goes around, that settles around that prohibition. So I think that very seriously, not only globally, but even regionally and every country has to relook at its drug policy from a more uh, discriminatory, non-discriminatory manner, from the rights perspective, and from looking at it that prohibition has spiraled off crime rather than the other way around. Michelle, um, so the issue of drug reform is often framed as a public health issue. <coughs> and you've traveled all around the world in your capacity um, as a medical professional. And you interacted a great deal with public health workers on this issue. And what would you say the role was of public health, issue, uh, public health workers? And what are their perceptions? And how do they play into this debate on um, how we engage with people and hear the stories of people who, who are using drugs? Thank you. Um, I must say, as a physician, I'm sorry to say that the the healthcare settings are not immune from prejudice, from stigma and discrimination. Um, I've been traveling in many parts of the world, as you, you just said. I've seen shining examples of individuals working in very difficult contexts, doctors, nurses, social workers. But wherever I have been, um, I have always heard from people using drugs that they have been facing stigma and discrimination in society and stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings. So uh, I have seen in many countries people being denied access to treatment, let's say to AIDS treatment, to hepatitis treatment, or even to urgent hospitalization because they were not, quote, clean please come back when you will not be using or injecting uh, anymore, uh, and we will then take care of you, um, based on, on myths, you know, uh, one being that uh, people who inject drugs or use drugs do not care about their health, uh, or uh, that they wouldn't be compliant to treatment. And the evidence in the literature is absolutely opposite to that. People who inject drugs, just as anyone, uh, are very much taking care of their health. And, uh, and these people are also some of the most compliant patients. There are trials in hepatitis C treatment showing that it is as effective um, as in peop among people using drugs as it would be with anyone. So myths, misperceptions. I've seen, of course, uh, also uh, people who would be denied options for treatment because the physicians would think that abstinence is the only goal of treatment. And I have seen people, physicians, healthcare settings in highly ideologically politicized um, environments who, who would not be able to deliver uh, the healthcare. I was in Southeast Ukraine um, in the separatist regions a few months after in Crimea and then in Donetsk and Lugansk, people who were on substitution therapy were then denied access to, um, to, to substitution therapy leading to, to hundreds of deaths. And of course in Eastern Europe and in many parts of Asia, if you look back at the history, there's been hundreds of thousands of people who, who died of HIV or hepatitis uh, because of lack of proper access to, to treatment. Um, the, the other point I'd like to make is that the complexity of access to controlled medicines because of the international drug control system and the lack of proper education of physicians in many parts of the world are also a source of under-prescription of opioids uh, let's say, for pain management when they're needed. Uh, and not only do many countries in the world do not access well enough these drugs, but patients within many countries do not access properly and enough these drugs when, when they're needed. Or they're 
inappropriately prescribed, as we saw in the US with the opioid uh, epidemic. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, again, while well, I've seen extraordinary example of people working in difficult settings, I'm also really uh, you know, sorry about the state of affairs because first, the healthcare setting is one of the, is the sort of port of entry for the person who uses drugs, who inject drugs to the care and to the social uh, support system. Uh, and if they're rejected at the very entry, uh, then there's just no way they can go uh, further um, in the system. And then, of course, doctors are also people who are listened to in the society. And I would expect them, uh, rather than being discriminating people injecting drugs, to be at the forefront of, of, of our fight for reforms. Thank you. Well, I think that was a fantastic start to the discussion. Um, but I suspect that in the minds of many people uh, in this audience uh, that there are many other questions that have been raised. I mean, not least of which is how do we change the perceptions of people about the issue of drugs and what impact that these um, changes might have on the way we approach the issue. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor now. Um, I'm going to stop myself from asking further questions, although I have many. Um, two people who wish to um, take the floor, particularly interested in questions um, from younger people in our audience. I see there are quite a few, which is brilliant. Um, and um, I'm wondering if uh, some people might bring different perceptions from their own experiences, some of their friends, some of their family experiences um, into the room. So um, who would like to ask the first um, question. Claire, um, I think I ought to give you the first question. I introduced Claire York, who worked on this issue in Chatham House for many years. So welcome back, Claire. Thank you. Um, yes, Claire York. I'm now at King's College in London. Um, and I, I thought, looking at the executive summary of the report, what's really striking, um, as Dr. Lewis also said, is the importance of people's stories and of understanding different people's experiences and relationships with drugs. Um, my own work is on empathy and international relations, and so very much about this value of understanding different people and their experiences. But one of the challenges that there is with empathetic discourses is, is that it also has to be balanced with ideas of strength and credibility and a beneficial context to enable understanding to be articulated in a way that will be understand and understood. Given the dominant narratives we've had about drugs being um, associated with criminality and insecurity and immoral behavior, how do, how do you think politicians can communicate a new narrative and something different that balances this need for understanding with the same need for strength and credibility that they are doing something that is in the interest of the people and the communities that they are serving? Thank you. Well, we've got a number of politicians and former politicians amongst us, so who'd like to go first on, on that issue? Well, Ruth. I think the most important is really to, to show that you are entering into the conversation with the people you want really to have integrated in the society and not marginalized. Uh, to take example of uh, what my predecessor began and what I could do, for instance, in Switzerland was for instance, to have huge conferences with the people using drug, with uh, their families, with police, with uh, social workers, and so all together it was in the parliament room with a huge attendance. But it was also visiting the places where the, the people are, are living. And uh, if they agreed with that, uh, to take also the media with, uh, with, uh, with me, for this conversation, because when you have a minister or a president just going to, the, to have this conversation face to face, which means that you, sh you show perhaps your face, but what is more important, you show the real human face of, of your counterpart, is I think something uh, very important. And what was also, uh, I think, uh, a way to change the perception was just to, to have a, a very serene, serious uh, 
uh, evidence-based discourse about what the substance is, who are the people who use them, and what can be done. And uh, as you know, uh, Switzerland is fortunate. I don't think every time that it is a great chance, because from time to time, the decision of the voters are not exactly what I would like to have as an answer. <laughs> But because we have uh, every three months, more or less, the possibility to have a referendum, many of these referendums, we had, I think, in Switzerland, 15 referendum on local, cantonal, or national level on drug issue. So there was a real obligation to inform the people in a very quiet way, and they followed generally uh, what we proposed. So yes, we have to, to show that we are just face to face with these people. They are, not, they are on our eye level. Thank you. Um, please. Uh, Good day, Edmund Goldrick, uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies and freelance journalist. Um, now, I appreciate this is being streamed and so that might hamper responses, but firstly to Sinek, uh, what are the, the UK press elements that have vested interests against reform and what are those interests? And for the other, panel members, what other vested interests have you encountered sort of resisting reform efforts? And best, by vested interests, you mean? Uh, interests with a perhaps financial yeah. interest in opposing reform. Thank you. So Nick, do you want to? No, 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 sorry, then the, the I mis-expressed, I didn't express, I'm not saying there are, there are financial vested interests related to a a, a prohibition ideology which run parts of the British press. I said there are vested interests, politically vested interests in the press uh, who take a, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, it's actually, it's become quite more interesting. I said the Daily Mail is just kind of like a, about as sort of aggressive um, and obstructive on this as you can possibly, and, and, and vilify and savage any government that tries to do anything. In fact, it was the Daily Mail that bullied Gordon Brown taking that ludicrous decision against all evidence to reclassify cannabis a few years ago. Do, do, do you remember? Um, this, by the way, despite the fact that in Britain, probably the most reformist government in drugs policy, oddly enough, because of the HIV crisis at the time, was the Thatcher government at the, at the time. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't map onto a right-left thing, actually, this, this policy. Um, whereas the Sun, I don't know what's happened recently, but certainly when I was in government and I used to try and kind of lift the lid on this by talking about the need to stop, you know, incarcerating people who, who, uh, who have used drugs for their own, uh, you know, for their own purposes and, and with no other effect on anybody else. Actually, The Sun, interestingly enough, um, was supportive of reform. I don't know what's happened since. So it may be shifting a bit, but, but tra you know, tra traditionally, you know, papers like the Mail have got this sort of abnormally firm grip on particularly the Conservative Party are remarkably ferocious in, in, in seeking to thwart any moves towards reform, which is why, in the British political context, a lot of that reform is now taking place, as I described earlier, in an almost sort of subterranean way. It's sort of happening in an ad hoc, haphazard, devolved way, just because there isn't the political space nationally at the moment. And hopefully that'll change. Michelle. Let, let, let's also be clear, there are countries I would, in Eastern Europe, in Asia, where uh, corrupted police uh, is, uh, is actually lobbying and pressuring for not moving into reforms. And in the US, there is resistance to reform from a lobby of people involved in the private prison industry. Just to, to be clear. So Asma, Asma, you talked about vested interests. Oli, you talked about yeah, vested interests. I mean, interests. even parliamentarians. I mean, we have an election to Senate in Pakistan, and a lot of drug money is used to buy votes. Yeah. So, and it's very open. Uh, if you go to the uh, uh, Fata area, which is the tribal area in Pakistan, uh, people will tell you this is drug lord so and so, and for a whole two miles, you will see uh, his uh, wall outside wall of his house, and then another place there's drug lord so-and-so, another five miles, he has a house, so it's, um, and people go there, politicians go there, uh, it's all kosher, journalists go there, it's fine. We, we, we found, <coughs> when we looked at uh, the situation in West Africa, that 
drug money is gradually going into politics. And uh, drug barons are also becoming politicians. We have in Nigeria a senator who is a wanted drug baron in America and is a member of the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That's how bad uh, the situation is getting in our part of the world. So there's money involved. I think also a lot of terrorist groups use drug money. So I think we, because there are reports on it. So we should not underestimate the, um, the exploitation of criminalization of drugs. So if you take the lady here in the scarf, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Angelica. I'm from Colombia. And I'm currently working on a production of a, a theatrical play that looks at, uh, it's called Stardust. You're all invited. Uh, that looks into the production of cocaine, obviously being a Colombian that has affected us a lot. Uh, but also, uh, it looks, it's a journey that it looks also at the people, the patients that actually have no alternative than growing coca. Um, and also, how we have been carrying the stigma of being the producer, the largest producer of cocaine around the world, but also looks at how coca has been actually used by our indigenous communities as, as medicine, because it's, it's considered sacred by them. So I'm just wondering how the commission is actually looking at those patients that are actually producing uh, coca because they have no option, and how the criminalization is actually can benefit them as well, not just the consumer, but also those who have no choice. So one of the things in the report that I think is, is very powerful is it looks at traditional use as well um, around the world. But I'm going to take a couple of other questions, uh, one here and then one there, please. Um, John Warren, physician. Do you think there's much to learn from the history of alcohol? Alcohol still causes a lot of addiction, morbidity, mortality, yet there's very inconsistent worldwide approach to prohibition, let alone regulation. <clears throat> Do you think the title should all be involved, drug and alcohol? Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Adeso Jadini is my name. I just want to know, after this report, what next? What, next? what practical steps are you taking to influence opinions, especially at the leadership level in Africa? Uh, President Obasanjo, you've been the head of state of Nigeria twice, and you have a very strong influence on leaders across West Africa. What practical steps are you taking as a father, as a grandfather, to make sure that these issues are addressed? Thank you. And, and I would add into that, you know, what's the discussion within the African Union, as but well the as within the... the question I'd like to Africa. answer first. And I, I would really caution against it, because as the world is becoming more conservative, you may have prohibition on alcohol as well. <laughs> well, we do have prohibition of alcohol still in some countries, right? Yeah, but you'll have it in more countries. Yeah. So, well, let, let, let Oli, me, why don't you? Um, <laughs> you are right, but uh, let me say what came out, or, or almost as we were producing our report. Uh, from the West African Commission on Drug. The ECOWAS country then came out with a policy, an ECOWAS policy on drug. Um, the AU has followed with an AU policy on drug. Um, I won't attribute all that to our effort, but our effort must be part of uh, that. Um, what we do, uh, what we had done, of course, was we have sent our report not only to West African countries, but leaders all over Africa. And um, this report, uh, the one that you are waving at me now, we are going to do the same um, through the instrumentality of uh, uh, Professor Kebukola, who is here with me, and who runs uh, what we call Center for Human Security. Uh, we will have, normally we call people, we have discussion on this uh, at the national level and at the regional level. And um, 
we will, of course, formally send it to the uh, government through the ministry that we believe should have uh, this. Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Education, Ministry of uh, uh, Health, and, and that's what we do. Helen, on the um, crop production issue and development issue. Well, my understanding, I'm not so familiar with Colombia, but if you take the economics of it in Afghanistan, uh, a, a least developed country with very poor uh, transportation infrastructure, uh, from the, the point of view of the small producer, uh, yes, they, they could grow things other than poppies, but there isn't a distribution system. But there's always a distribution system for his drugs because you have people, uh, you know, very significant criminal and terrorist uh, networks which have an interest in getting this good, good to market when they don't have the same interest in getting carrots to market or coriander or, or, or something. So, uh, you know, you, you could destroy all the crops you like, but unless people have practical alternative livelihoods based on, you know, a level of development which will get goods to market, you're not going to have uh, any, any impact uh, uh, that way. Um, I was just also reflecting back to, I guess, the very first uh, question about what, what narrative do we need in our societies to get reform? And I think it, it is very much about uh, putting the human face uh, on, on the issues. And often families get their awareness raised of if one of their family members is caught up in the criminalisation. You know, the, 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 the person who goes to jail, the, you know, the student who is doing well, has a drug offence, a record, a criminal record and so on. Um, if you think of, of what really prompted brave responses to HIV, it was people dying. Uh, now, people are dying from bad drug policy, in effect. And I would hope that you know, there can be some reflection on that in, in the United Kingdom, which I understand has uh, drug-induced deaths at about three times the European average. Is this the sort of statistic the UK wants? I, I don't think so. Uh, so the human face will be incredibly important in changing hearts and minds among legislators and, and decision makers that something needs to be done. Can I just go to Michelle a moment? Because, Michelle, you mentioned earlier about the, the need for opioids and um, the need for the sorts of drugs that we're actually trying to stop being produced in some places. Why aren't we being <coughs> smarter about the production of those types of drugs in our medical profession, where there, as I understand, there's a shortage in many countries of these types of drugs? Yep, and um, what should you also keep in mind that the production of the growing crops, you know, for um, for, for medical purposes is strictly limited to rich countries somehow. So those countries that are harsh on the others because they grow illegally are the, crown, the, 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 the countries that grow legally. Australia, France is actually supplying Switzerland, if I'm not uh, wrong. Um, but let, let me just, I, I'd like to go back for a second to the question on, on Colombia. Uh, because, as, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, President Gaviria is a part of our commission, and we've been discussing this uh, a lot uh, within the commission. In our latest report on decriminalization, we have been calling for, re from, for removing from criminal justice m offenses such as um, the, for, for those in, in, in minor um, drug-related uh, work, including, of course, the farmers who, who, who grow out of economic pressure and have no alternative. We have also been uh, always supporting all efforts for finding economic alternatives for, for these people. Uh, UNDP has done a lot of work in Colombia. We have also been denouncing, uh, and particularly in, in a publication on health, the negative impact of spraying uh, on, on, on the people in Colombia and in these regions where, where crops were, were sprayed. Um, and we're even, the, as the Global Commission quoted, in the, in the peace agreement in Colombia as a potential 
mediator. So our position is, is very clear, and uh, it is that in no way should these farmers that have no economic alternative at this time be considered as criminal and, and fall under criminal justice law. Ruth, did you want to come in? Ruth, I have to answer about the next steps. Uh, yes. On, uh, on one side, the next steps for this, uh, for this report is really to, uh, to advocate at all level. I mean, uh, my friend uh, Obasanjo spoke about uh, advocating at the highest authorities, but uh, uh, also to, to enter into a discussion with the media to change the vocabulary. I mean, all this is uh, an activity we want to continue. We are launching, uh, launching today, uh, and it is important, <coughs> I think, that we uh, put emphasis about the need to change the language and to, to change the perception, and so to break this uh, vicious circle that aliment uh, repressive uh, policy and the repressive policy is alimenting uh, the stigma and so on. So there is really something that we have to, to break. As for, for years we said our first uh, ambition is to break the taboo and to speak about drugs. Now our, our ambition is to break the vicious circle from stigma to criminalization and to speak uh, not only with authorities, but all opinion uh, leaders. Now, the next steps also for the commission is uh, to uh, go more in depth on the question of regulation. Uh, because we, we feel, and from the beginning, we thought the only way to be really uh, coherent is not only to have a public health approach, to have a decriminalization and so on, but to take the market, the whole business from criminal hands and to put it in the responsible hands of uh, the states. But this is uh, very easy to say. It's not so easy to propose the different models, different from one substance, to the other, different from one country and, and culture to, to the other. So this is the huge task we have put for us. Now, perhaps to come back to the perception also, uh, as you know, probably, the international community will have the opportunity in uh, 2019 to review, and we hope it will be a serious review, about the 10 last year of uh, the plan of action. Uh, and we will work also uh, in uh, uh, pushing for a real assessment, which will be not just uh, the general worlds and the Caesar of, uh, of, uh, and the number of arrests and so on, but uh, uh, metrics that will uh, really tell us what are the consequences of this, uh, of this policy. Uh, but it is also to change the vocabulary on the international level. If you think that uh, in the convention you are speaking about the evil, the substance is an evil, and if the substance is an evil, you can imagine who is the person who is in touch with this <coughs> evil. So I mean, we have also to fight for a more uh, serene, evidence-based, calm, uh, vocabulary on the international level, and this is one of our activity for the next months and uh, for the next years to come. Thank you. Well, we've still got some time for some questions, so I'm going to go to the lady um, at the back with her hand raised, and then these two gentlemen here. Thank you. Um, just to echo Ruth's point there, I think it's really important that instead of seeing these things Could you as, introduce uh, yourself, sorry? Sorry? Could you introduce yourself? Sorry, my name's Pospal Curran from UCL. Um, I'm a scientist working on medical uses Thank of you. various kinds of drugs. And one of the most exciting developments in this field have been that drugs that are perceived as street drugs and evil have actually been found to have more important medical uses. I mean, a lot of what's been happening in the States in terms of changed perceptions has been that analysis of the cannabis plant in terms of <coughs> over 100 different cannabinoids one of which is showing extremely effective in children with very severe epilepsies. 
And that began in Colorado when a very clever parent decided to take this up himself with a, a little girl called Charlotte. And her <coughs> epilepsy episodes were reduced by 90%. And it will be another two years before that drug called Epidiolex now, a cannabinoid, is widely available. But a lot of parents are giving it to their children anyway. Similarly, something like ketamine has now been shown to be an effective antidepressant and next year it will go before the Federal Drug Agency in the States to be recognized as a medicine. So maybe a bit of changing the perception about drugs being evil is actually to, to, to capitalize on what science is showing in terms of these drugs can have benefits. If we can get rid of the scheduling at international level and promote research. But at the moment, Schedule 1 defines these drugs as having no medical use. Thank you. Um, so at the front here, please, and then behind. Thank you. Uh, okay, that way around's fine. Um, my name is Ala Kuentlov from the Institute of Economic Affairs. And my question is directed at uh, former president of Bassinger uh, on uh, taking the uh, observation that most of sub Saharan countries in Africa are um, uh, Christian fundamentalists. Uh, do you think uh, that there's a role for pastors in these uh, organizations uh, to uh, educate the masses in, um, in lowering the stigma? So the role of faith communities Correct. generally in changing perceptions. Correct, yeah. Yes, thank you. Anthony Newton, two short questions, if I may. They really are short. First of all, has the commission or its members ever been intimidated, threatened, or induced in any way? And if so, what have they done about it? And Is that just this evening? Or? <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, where does the funding come from? The funding for the commission? Yes. Yeah. Good question. Okay, I can answer this you can answer uh, that question uh, very easily. I think we were never threatened. Uh, even if we think that uh, if all our program will be realized, some people will lose a lot of money uh, from the criminal organization and a lot of power. But uh, OK, uh, no, we, we, we are safe. Now, the funding is, uh, is also very clear. We, we are funded by uh, three foundations. One is uh, the Open Society Foundation. Uh, and I must say the Open Society is perhaps the main funder for reform all over the world in uh, drug policy. The second is uh, UNITE, uh, the foundation created by our member, uh, Sir Richard, Richard Brunson. And uh, the third foundation is a foundation called OAK, uh, which was created by a family from Denmark, if I remember, family Parker, uh, which is also really um, eager to support uh, open society in the broad <coughs> sense of the world uh, policies. And the Swiss uh, Confederation is also uh, supporting us uh, because for now a uh, year and a half, a little bit more, our secretariat is in Geneva and Switzerland is eager to support NGOs and uh, agencies from the UN and to have in Geneva a platform, a platform which uh, uh, focus is on health, on human rights, uh, and on security in a, in a broader sense also, so that we are really considered as one of these ecosystem, pa uh, part of the eco Geneva uh, international ecosystem as on the side more of the NGOs, but uh, we are a special kind, uh, special animal. We are not exactly an uh, NGO. We are just a club of, uh, as I told before, world citizen. Michelle, do you want to address the um, medical yeah. um, use of, of drugs? And other, yes, other than well, I, I have little to add. Just thank you for your uh, comment. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the paradox is that the same substance will be looked totally different uh, on whether it's used in a medical context, let's say geomorphine. <laughs> and uh, as a street drug, heroin. But it's the same substance. 
Uh, and for many, if not actually most, of the uh, drugs that we're discussing today, they have this dual uh, either activity or, at, or potential. And we're certainly very open and very supportive of um, every attempt now to, to use the many potential uh, benefits that we could have from the, from the medical use of some of these psychoactive substances that so far have only been sort of used uh, I illegally. But research is itself prevented by the fact that they're illegal uh, and, and by the international control system. How can you perform a clinical, a randomized clinical trial, uh, you know, in, in a setting where the substance is illegal? Um, so that's, that's one of the things we're, we're certainly denouncing. Uh, and also the fact uh, which was somehow implicit in some of what you said, that the current classification of how dangerous the drugs are uh, in, 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 the, in the UN system and the scheduling has nothing to do as first shown here in Britain by David Nutt and, and others, nothing to do with the actual dangerosity uh, when measured on the ground. So we are also calling for a revision of the scheduling system. Um, just for the anecdote, you know, cannabis was last reviewed by WHO in 1935. Faith-based issues. Okay. The faith uh, based uh, effort. When we, our, our, our commission went round, one of the best rehabilitation centers that we found, we found quite a lot, but the best was faith-based rehabilitation center. Um, the problem of clergy, either of Christian or Muslim, going forward is the fact that they cannot be seen to be encouraging criminality. And we were told this, that if they will do what they have been doing, trying to build rehabilitation centers, look, taking uh, people out of uh, the street and all that. But they can join us now <coughs> in this idea of changing the perception using the correct language and um, you're seeing this not as evil, not as criminal issue, but as health issue. And we are going to engage them. We have done that in the past. Some of them kept away and said, we do not want to be seen as encouraging criminality. And, uh, but if we start moving away from seeing this as criminal, we see it as health issue. And we debate it and talk about it as health issue. Surely, faith, uh, uh, ministers, religious ministers, and community uh, leaders will be the people who will help us tremendously. Well, I, that's a great note on which to end. I wish we could carry on, and I know there are many more questions that people have, um, but we have to end it here, I'm afraid. Um, we are serving a legal drug, which I'm told in moderation, and we're, that is up for us to decide, is very good for you. Um, but in excess is very bad for you. <laughs> so um, I invite you all to come upstairs where I hope that um, some of our panel here tonight will be here to um, answer further questions, engage in further conversation, and I welcome you all upstairs. And I'm sorry for those that I couldn't call on uh, to ask questions. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.